It's good to see everybody. We're going to be wrapping up this uh, sermon series, God of All Comfort, this, uh, this morning. So we're going to be spending time in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So if you want to turn there, you're welcome to, or you can follow along on the screen. Everything will be up there as well. Um, as I was sitting there, I was thinking about uh, a verse that I, I should have put up on the screen, but I didn't. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and read it to you. Um, but this ended our last study when we were in chapter 3, and it really kind of springboards us into this next chapter, chapter 4, uh, as we continue through through this topic. And, and so this is 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. So let me go ahead and read that to you, and that will help us kind of get started with our lesson this morning. Uh, Paul says this, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. And, and so Paul is, has been discussing this new covenant that, that has been given by God and how he and the other apostles are ministers of this new covenant. And that the new covenant comes with a greater amount of significance. In fact, he it's more glorious than the old covenant was. Uh, and so Paul is using this as kind of an illustration, an analogy to support himself and the other apostles in their work. And so when we get into, into chapter 4, Paul is going to continue def defending his apostolic authority. He's going to continue defending his, his um, fellow workers in the Lord, uh, as there are some in Corinth and around Corinth that might be stirring up some trouble for him um, and trying to make him look bad. And so let's go ahead and start by reading verse 1 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul says this, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we received mercy, we do not lose heart. And I like the English Standard Version. Sometimes I, I like to read other versions just to get an idea of how uh, different writers might reword some of the interpretation um, when, they're, when they're working on, on the uh, English version of these texts. But the ESV says this, Therefore, having his, this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. And, and so the reason it's a little bit different is because some, some people kind of look at what Paul had said in chapter 3, and Paul is, is just kind of uh, piggybacking on that in continuation of that. And some people believe that what Paul is talking about is what he's about to say. So either way, it, I don't know if, if you'd be wrong either way you look at that, but the point is that Paul considers his ministry— and, and he has said this other places, not just here, but he, he considers his ministry God's mercy towards him, or God's grace. It, it's as if it's as Paul is receiving a gift, a, a gift to be able to go and to preach about Jesus, that, that his apostleship is a gift, that God has extended grace to him, and that grace is he, he going to the Gentiles and preaching Jesus. And, and Paul looks at it so differently than, than the Corinthians may look at it. And so they may look at his ministry and they may say things like, well, you know, that Paul is just looking for a reputation. He wants to make a name for himself. Or that Paul is just wanting money. Or that Paul just wants to have the power and the authority. He wants to be in charge. And Paul will come back and say, no, that, that's not the point at all. Do, do I need to have a good reputation? Yeah, that, that's important um, because my message is so important. Do, do I need funding to, to do the things I do? Well, yeah, because I've, I've got to travel and I've got to eat and I've got to have clothes to wear. I mean, there, there are things that are necessities of life that require money. And if I'm going to focus on this, I need some way to, to pay for those things. You know, Paul is very clear about this. But he also says, but my ministry is an expression of God's mercy, that my ministry is a gift from God, that I don't take credit for any of it, but it is God working through me, bringing about the perfect result. Let's go ahead and keep reading it in chapter 4 and verse 2. It says this, But we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness 
or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. He wants to make sure. And there were certainly people that were peddling the word of God. There were certainly people out there that wanted to be recognized. They wanted the money. They wanted the prestige. They wanted the reputation. And they were coming in, and, and in order to, to build themselves up, they were tearing other people down. I, we've known people like that. I'm sure that you've encountered people like that in life, where in order to build themselves up, they tear other people down. And Paul calls these people peddlers of the word, that they're, they're trying to peddle the gospel. They're trying to go out and make money and make a reputation and, and gain something from the people. And so Paul wants to separate himself from that group of people. He wants to make sure that he is being completely open, completely exposed, that there's nothing hidden, there's no ulterior motive, that Paul is just there to be a servant of the church and a servant of God. And he wants them to know that. And he wants them to acknowledge that. He wants them to, to look at themselves and ask themselves hard questions about who they are and why they're there and, and why they even care. <laughs> why, why are these other preachers so interesting to them? Why, why are they so attractive to them? Is, there, is it their message is it that is that the thing, or or is it because they simply want to be seen with them? Maybe they don't want to be seen with Paul. Maybe Paul's appearance is just so atrocious because of, of, of his lifestyle that they just don't want to be recognized as a servant or as even having any connection at all with Paul. And Paul needs them to look at themselves as well and ask these hard questions. Look at verse 3. He says, and even if our gospel is veiled. Remember that phrase veiled was used in the last chapter to talk about the fact that when Moses came off Mount Sinai, the glory of God radiated off his face and he had to veil his face. And, and, and you know, he says, you know, some of, the, some of the people of that day are still living under that old law of Moses and they, they haven't taken the time to, to lift the veil and say, wait. Where's all the glory? <laughs> you know, and, and so Paul made that point last time, and, and he's just kind of piggybacking on that idea. But he says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In other words, the only reason there's a veil, it's not because of us, it's not because we're covering anything, it's not because we're hiding anything, it's all very much plain and easy to see, but it's because some people just don't want to know. They want the veil to remain. They don't want to peek behind the veil. They would rather not know. It is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. They just don't want to see Jesus. They don't want to see God's glory. They don't want to see what's plainly in front of them. They would prefer to have that covered. And Paul says, as for us, we're, we're not veiling anything. We're not covering anything up. We're not holding anything back. We, we are exposed and open. We are, we are expressing the glory of God to whomever wants to see. But to some people, the reason it's still veiled is because they are choosing to allow it to remain veiled for them. And, what, and who is there to take advantage of that attitude, right? He says, well, the, the God of this world, he, he's right there. He, he's hanging out close by. It's probably talking about and most likely the devil himself, right? And he, he's right there. And he's going to take advantage of that opportunity. He's going to blind their mind. This person that has an unbelieving heart so that they may not see. Now, it's not to say that the devil's going to come around and, and force people not to see, and it doesn't say he's going to purposely veil anything per se, but he's going to take an ad advantage of what's already there. He's an opportunistic person. <laughs> you know, he's going to take advantage of an opportunity. It, they were already bent that direction. They were already moving that direction. Their attitude was already there, and, and here he is, quick, to respond. And he's going to make sure 
with all of his power, that he's going to keep people from seeing the truth, that they don't want to see the truth in reality, and he's going to make sure that happens. So it's a choice that they make personally. But, but Paul is recognizing, hey, there, there's this other force working behind the scenes, and, and he's going to make sure of it. He's going to give them what they want. And so we might think about some people in the world today, and we might think, well, why can they not see the truth, right? Why can't they just see what's right in front of them, what we have plainly seen? You know, in, in thinking about the glorious radiance of the gospel in light of the, the radiant glow of Moses' face, you know, that kind of imagery, it's just the presence of God. A lot of us who have willingly allowed the veil to be lifted so that we can see the glory of God through the image of Jesus, that, that we look at other people and we think, how can you not see this? It is right in front of you. In fact, you know, we have to wear shades, right? I mean, we had to cover our face at the glory of of God through Jesus and the world cannot see. They're just walking around. I don't know what you're talking about. I can't see anything. The God of this world has blinded them to see the manifestation of the glory that comes from Jesus. Look at verse 5. He says, for we do not preach ourselves, right? That's not the point. It's not about Paul. It's not about Apollos. It's not about Peter. They don't preach themselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord. He wants to establish that. It's not about us. Yes, they're apostles. Yes, they're given an amazing task and an important work. But Paul even says it doesn't really matter because it's not about us. It's about us doing the work of the Lord. It's about us preaching Jesus. That's the important thing. That's the most important thing. And we want to make sure we do it to the best of our ability. We preach ourselves but Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as your bondservants. Now, he sometimes says, Christ's bondservant or God's bondservant. In this case, he's saying, I'm your bondservant. I'm a bondservant of the church. I'm a bondservant of the church for Jesus' sake. For God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Now, he's still talking about his apostolic ministry, and he recognized what God has given him is for others. That, that God has empowered Paul to do miraculous things. God has given him wisdom beyond his comprehension. God has given him everything he needs to go out and do the work that he has been called to do. But he recognizes it's not for himself. It's not for his own boasting. It's not for his own glory. It is for you. It is for you. That's what God has done. And I am just simply sharing with you what God has entrusted with me. And that's, that's where Paul is with his thinking. He wants them to understand that. Look at verse 5. He says this. This is the way Paul puts it. He says, but we have this, this treasure. And, and the treasure is in, in probably a, a multifaceted way of thinking about it. Everything that Paul has already said. It is the ministry. It is the truth. It is the word. It is the uh, be, having been entrusted with this wonderful, glorious gift of preaching Jesus. It's all of that. It's, it's all of that kind of bound up into this one word that Paul calls treasure. But he says, we have this treasure in earth and vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. Now, you may interpret that as Holy Spirit. Some people interpret that treasure as Holy Spirit. I, it kind of, all to me, kind of sums up into one, one idea anyway. It's the Holy Spirit that presents the Word and gives them the power. I don't know if really we need to distinguish all of those things. But nonetheless, Paul recognizes that what's inside of him, what he is sharing with others, is from God and it's powerful. And God gets the glory for all of it. And what does he call himself? He says, you know what I am? I'm an earthen vessel. And, and, you know, we, we have glass jars, but we don't really have earthen vessels, you know. And so you can imagine a clay pot, you know. I mean, how brittle is a clay pot, you know. And, and just imagine putting a priceless treasure inside of a clay pot, right. It's hidden until it's revealed, but the clay pot offers very little protection, right. There's, there's not a whole lot the clay pot can do. It's fragile, Eventually, it's going to break. It's not going to last forever. 
Some archaeologist someday is going to discover it, and it's going to be pieces and shards. But what the, what's in it has the greatest value. And God has entrusted. Now, this is the hard part to understand, okay? God has entrusted an incredible gift, a treasure, beyond words, beyond comprehension, beyond value. And he has given it and placed it inside of earthen vessels, people. And you think, you start to question at times the wisdom of God in doing that because you think to yourself, God, don't you know us? I mean, seriously. I mean, we're flawed people. We make so many mistakes and we're fragile. But God says, no, no, I entrusted this to you. Knowing full well that you're flawed people and you're fragile. Knowing full well your weaknesses because I created you. And I know you intimately. But I have entrusted this treasure to you. I could have very well sent angels to do that. I could have sent whomever. I could have spoken myself. But I have chosen this. And Paul is recognizing that. And he's saying, you know, there's a tendency and there's a problem with that 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 is evident. There will be some who will take a precious treasure like that and they will exploit it and they will abuse it and they will misuse it. And Paul says, but that's not us. Our conscience is clear. We know our motives for preaching. We know our motives for presenting the treasure. We know our motives. But beware of those who don't. Beware of those who have other alternative motives. Beware of those who are looking for self-satisfaction and self-preservation. Beware of those people. But Paul says, as for us, you can trust that we are servants and bond servants of the precious treasure. Look at verse 8. He says this, We are afflicted in every way. This is Paul's example. This is his earthen vessel. This is what happens with the earthen vessel. He says, We're afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but, but not despairing. Persuaded, or persecuted rather, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Verse 12, so death works in us, but life in you. You hear what Paul was saying? He says, you know, what's, what's inside of us, this precious gift, this treasure, this message, this, this ability to preach Jesus, that, that that is what's important. Now, as for the earthen vessel, it's been through a lot. Paul says. It, it has chips, it has Mars, it has scars, it has all kinds of things. But you know what? It, it will ultimately end in death. In fact, in fact, Paul even goes so far as to say, you know, the death of Jesus is, is imminent within us. We understand that. That's what we have been called to. That is not important to us. We've already been down that road. We have faced death several times. We have come to near death. God has granted us the ability to continue moving forward. And as long as he continues to do that, we will continue to do it. But as death continues to work within the apostles knowing full well that that is their ultimate destiny for being ministers and housing the treasure of God within them, that death is imminent, that that leads to life and whomever they come in contact with. Life comes through the treasure. And Paul knows that. And he says, as for us, it's death. But as for you, it is life. And they will continue working Regardless, But look what he says. But having the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore we also speak. Now we may miss the reference. Uh, Paul is actually quoting from Psalm 116. That whole psalm is about difficulties and stress and distress and affliction. I'd like to read a little bit for you just to get an idea of where Paul's coming from. He said, the psalmist says this, The cords of death encompassed me. The terrors of Sheol, that's just death, 
come upon me. I found distress and sorrow. When I called upon the name of the Lord, O oh Lord, I beseech you, save my life. And so that's where Paul is coming from. This, this whole concept of, of if, if I, I believe, therefore I, I spoke, that it comes from a mindset that says, this is how it is sometimes. That life in general is difficult. That death is constantly a reminder that it's imminent, that it's right there. It encompasses us. It is constantly present. It's like this, this haunting presence that is always there. That we, we call out to God and we say, God, rescue me. Save me. We understand that. But Paul will continue to say, yes, I know, and that's how I live my life, that every day I know that this, this may be the end for me, that, that all of this work and all the people that I have, have offended over the years because of the preaching of the gospel of Jesus, that might come to my end. And if that's what God has in store for me, then that's it. But in the meantime, I will continue to preach regardless of the outcome. Look at verse 14. He says, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with him. So, so the death of Jesus is working within them as they are going out and they're ministering, knowing full well that that ministry is ultimately going to lead to their death. But Paul is saying, my confidence is that someday, even when I die, God will rescue me. And that's a hard way, place to be, isn't it? Because a lot of times that's where we're at, is, is self-preservation. We want to avoid hardships. We want to avoid pain. We just want to avoid everything. And, and Paul says, you know, my ultimate hope doesn't rest in God preserving my life in the present. Because if it did, I would be very distressed and I would be very discouraged because I've been through a lot. But Paul is saying, my hope and my expectation and my faith and my trust is in a God who will one day raise me up from the grave, knowing full well that I will die, and I will be presented with Jesus. That's where his hope is. That's his expectation. That's what gives him the strength and the confidence to persevere. And he says in verse 415, for all things are for your sake, so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. The ripple effect of the apostles is outstanding. I mean, I don't even know if you thought about the significance of what these men accomplished in going out and preaching to the known world. That as they preached and as people listened and as the glory of Jesus was, was unveiled and revealed to them so that they may become part of the family of God, that as that took place, more people began to preach and teach and more people began to live the life that Jesus has called them to live. It's kind of like if you would imagine a whole world. I don't know if you've ever seen um, the earth from space. Probably not personally, but you know, it on YouTube or something like that. And, and you look down and you can see just darkness and, and lights. All these little lights everywhere, you know. And you can imagine that's what it looks like to God. That the whole world is in darkness but then there are these lights scattered everywhere. And you might imagine the apostles' lights illuminating greater than the others. And as they come in contact with somebody, then, then that person is exposed to the radiant glory of Jesus and they too become a light. And as they go to somebody else, it, it, it just kind of continues as a ripple effect. And the whole world for thousands of years has been illuminated by the radiant glory of the treasure that was within the apostles that has been presented leading to their death, but leading to our life, the glory of Jesus, the radiance of God, continuing to be exposed and continuing to illuminate the world as darkness overcomes it. Look at verse 16. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart, right? I mean, who would after knowing all of that, right? I mean, Paul understands the, the reality of his situation and he understands the future expectation that he has, the hope that he has, so who would lose heart? But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Now, I want you to make a note of this, but it, mentally, you know, you can write it down if you want to. The outer man, the inner man, it's the same man. You know, we don't want to be so quick to separate these ideas. Well, what Paul is simply saying is there is a part of Paul that is decaying. 
There's a part of Paul that is weak. There's a part of Paul that is exhausted and tired. And he just cannot understand how he can keep getting up in the morning, having been stoned and beaten and nearly put to death and shipwrecked and so on and so forth, with his body bruised and broken. And how can Paul get up every morning with the pain that comes from his body and continue going into the world and preaching Jesus? Paul says, that outer man, you know, that that person, that me, Oh, it is falling apart. It's decaying. It will not last. It will not withhold the test of time. But there's still a me that will. There's a part of me that will continue. There's a part of me that will, after this world is over, after this life is over, will remain. And Paul is so focused on that. He says, that is what is important. Because if I were just the one that was decaying, then I would be concerned. Right? If that was my whole focus, if I was only focused on the physical world, and I, I use that loosely because it has a lot of implications, but just if I was only focused on what is happening to me, my, my body as it is decaying, and that was my only concern was self-preservation, then, then who wouldn't be discouraged? Who wouldn't lose heart? But Paul's focus goes beyond that. And he says, because of that, I do not lose heart. I do not lose heart because my inner man is being renewed day by day. Now listen to this, verse 17. He says, for momentary light affliction. All right, what would you think about that? I mean, how would you define that? It might be different for different people. But we have to define it in Paul's words. And Paul has already acknowledged what he has gone through. All that he has experienced. All that he has talked. We've already talked about some of that. But yes, Paul was stoned dearly to death. If not to death, it's debatable. But nonetheless, we can imagine being pummeled by rocks to the point where people thought you were dead. You know, you can imagine Paul having been put in prison. And you can imagine the experiences that Paul has had in his life as he goes and serves the church. And as a bondservant of Jesus, you can imagine the hardship that his body has endured. And then you can look at Paul and Paul says, momentary light affliction. That's what Paul says. And we're like, seriously, Paul? Because that's tough, man. That's a lot. But Paul says, yeah, it was. But in comparison to the glory to come, it is momentary light affliction. And it is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond our comprehension. I mean, it, yes, it is, it's tough, and yes, it's bad, but reality has to set in. It's kind of Paul's comparison, if you're following along with that, the, the analogies that Paul uses, the old covenant being glorious, but the new covenant being so much more radiant that it overpowers and supersedes the old to where the old fades away. Paul is saying, you know, this life, it's glorious. This ministry, it's wonderful. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the world in regards to what God has created except for the fact that it is decaying because of sin. Our ministry is wonderful and it's glorious, but it it all pales in comparison to what is coming. In fact, Paul says, I don't even know how to comprehend it. But it is far greater than what we are experiencing and causes him such courage and strength as he perseveres. Look what he says in verse 18. He says, while we look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And it all comes down to focus, doesn't it? It all comes down to focus. We are able to endure a lot in this life if we have something to focus on and look forward to. A lot of people have gone through a lot of things in this world, but if they have something to focus on and look forward to, it helps them to get through those difficult times in life. And Paul is simply saying that what, what he sees, everything that he's looking at, the, the tangible, the, the things you can touch, the things you can smell, the things you can experience, all of these things that he called momentary light afflictions, he says, you know, those things, if I focused on those things, I mean, Paul would be a nervous wreck. But he's not focused on those things. He's focused on things that are unseen, that, that you can't really put your hand on. You really can't can't see it, you can't touch it, you can't smell it. It's not really something that's tangible, but it's there and it's real. In fact, 
it's more real. It is more tangible. It is more real than anything we can ever experience in this life. And the recognition of that is what gets Paul through this next stage in his life. He focuses on that. And the question would be, are we, are we focusing on current circumstances? I mean, is that where our focus is? Because, let's be honest, that can be very discouraging at times. Are we focused on current circumstances, or do we have the mind of Paul? And do we recognize that, you know, whatever current circumstance, however hard it may be, however challenging it may be, however scary it may be, it's a momentary light infl- affliction in comparison to the glory that awaits us. The comparison is just hard to even comprehend. But yet, yet alone, Paul recognizes that's where his focus is, that's where he's at. Things might look bad, but Paul recognizes that things will get better. And the world that we live in coexists, or Christians rather, coexist in these two worlds. We, we experience it in the present as we, as we live our life with the hopeful expectation, the eternal life that God has presented to us and given us through Jesus. We experience it right now. We're not all living just a bunch of miserable lives thinking, oh, I can't wait to die. That's not the point. No, we, we rejoice We rejoice in what we have in Jesus in the present, regardless of our current circumstances. So we coexist in a world where, yes, death and decay is a reality. But as for me, I am living the life, the eternal life that God has prepared for me in the present with the hopeful expectation of its reality coming in the future. Can I explain everything about that future expectation? I cannot. Do I have a good idea about what it's going to be like? I have a pretty decent idea. Are there things I don't know? There are things I don't know. But there is one thing I do know. The glory of the reality of our future existence, having been faithful in Jesus and exposed to the glory of God through Jesus, far surpasses any imagination. And so therefore we sit and we ponder and we wonder, but we use it as a motivation to recognize this is where I'm going. We need to be here. Folks, that needs to be something we think about. God wants us here. Why would God put a treasure in an earthen vessel? I I don't know. Um, That's beyond my wisdom. But it is the wisdom of God. Why would God entrust imperfect people to do this perfect work? I don't know. You know, why, why hand over the church to us we, when we make so many mistakes and we say so many things and we misunderstand so many things and, and, and we all read the same scripture but we come up to different conclusions, why would God do that? Doesn't he know how imperfect we are? And a lot of times it's more like, doesn't he know how, don't, doesn't God know how imperfect they are? You know, Because we are prideful. But the reality is God has. Does he expect us to to make some mistakes? I would imagine he probably knows that we're going to make some mistakes. Does he know we're going to misunderstand some things? Probably so. (laughs) Does that give us an excuse to be comfortable with that? No. It's a constant struggle. But as we strive to do the will of God and be more like Jesus, it's the maturing process that we need to do the things that we do. We need to be here. We need to be here because we need to be the light to a world that is becoming increasingly more dark. We need to be that light. We need to be the representation in a form and fashion of the representation that comes through Jesus, of the radiance of God's glory in a world that is becoming increasingly more dark. And hopefully, through us, more lights will be lit. But if we focus on this life only, I mean, if we're just so hyper-focused on this life in, in, in the everyday mundane things that we do, not to say those things aren't important, but if that becomes our focus, if self-preservation of life becomes our focus, then we are going to be very discouraged and very disheartened because this life is decaying and we're decaying. We're not going to make it out alive. I'm sorry to tell you. It doesn't matter how many pieces of kale you eat. It doesn't matter how many milkshakes you drink. Not, not the bad ones, but the good ones, I guess. It doesn't matter how healthy you live. It doesn't matter what you do. We are all decaying. And life is fleeting. 
And if we focus on this life only, we're going to be disheartened, we're going to be discouraged, and the joy that God has prepared for his people will be zapped out of us. But if we focus on the life to come, as it coexists with the life that we live, we can experience the surpassing joy that comes from knowing and belonging to Jesus because we have put our hope and our trust and our confidence not on the things that are fading away, but the things that are eternal and will never perish and never fade away. We have to live in this life, even though it is decaying. But our focus needs to be on the next life, the eternal life that God has prepared for us. And by focusing on what is to come, we can have comfort. And that's the kind of comfort we talk about. You know, when we talk about joy and we talk about comfort, you know, we might think, well, I've got a you know, comfortable comfort chair, and if I wear my comfy pants, I can sit in my comfy chair, and I can have some comfort. That's not it, <laughs> right? Or I can have some joy, you know, I say something like, you know, if I have a um, chocolate sundae, I can, I can have joy. That's not the joy we're talking about. We're talking about the comfort and joy that can only come from God, that he is the God of all comfort. That he can give comfort regardless of the circumstances so that the world looks at us and they say, man, how do you do it? I don't. Not of my own volition, but I do it because of the comfort that comes to me through the knowledge of the life that I will live in the future. And that's where we need to be. So it's all about focus. It's all about focus. What are we focusing on and how will it transform our life. So this morning, part of changing that focus is when we come to believe in Jesus and we accept him by being baptized into Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, receiving the Holy Spirit that will assist in the transformation process, and as we live for Jesus each and every day. That's the beginning. When we die with Christ and are raised to walk in newness of life. That opportunity is available for you this morning. If you haven't participated in that, the water is available. We can walk you through that process. Maybe you've been at this for a while and you've been very discouraged. Maybe you have lost heart and you need to refocus. We're here for you, whatever your needs may be. If you would please stand and come forward as we stand and sing.